In September 1941, a letter was posted in Madrid destined for a Catholic priest in the rural parish of Jordanstown in County Meath. Its contents were strange, to say the least. It carried news of events on the Eastern Front in the Second World War. The letter, however, never reached its intended recipient. Somewhere along the way it was intercepted by Irish military intelligence and was added to a growing file being gathered in Dublin. The priest in Jordanstown, who the letter was addressed to, a certain Father Daly, was of little or no interest to Irish military intelligence. However, since the start of the Second World War, they had stepped up their activities on potential threats to the Irish state and for one reason or another, which was never entirely clear, by 1941 they were trying to establish if the family of the Irish-American far-right activist Aileen O'Brien was related to the family of the veteran Republican Moira Louise O'Brien. Ultimately, what proved to be a protracted investigation of intercepting mail over several years proved the two women, Aileen and Moira Louise, and their respective families were not connected in any way other than the fact they shared the same surname. However, in the course of this investigation, Irish military intelligence collected a unique set of letters that provided a fascinating and unusual insight into one family's experience of the Second World War, that of Aileen O'Brien. By 1941, they would find their allegiances tested. While they were American citizens, they had personal and possible political connections to Nazi Germany. The letters were subsequently locked in an archive for decades, but recently have been opened to the public by the Irish military archives. And in this podcast, they give us a deeply personal account of the Second World War, yet one that is at times uncomfortable, given the people involved found common cause with fascists. Welcome to the Irish History Podcast. This episode is Divided Loyalties, Letters from the Second World War. It was researched, written and edited by myself, Finn Dwyer. The letters are narrated by Aidan Crow and Megan Carter. Now, episodes like this take considerable amounts of time to put together and are only possible because of the support of patrons who are listeners just like you who support the show over on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Now is a great time to support my work. In the coming weeks, there are several exciting projects on the way. In two weeks' time, that's August the 15th, Heritage Week starts in Ireland, and I've teamed up with Damien Shields, an archaeologist and historian who's the host of a podcast, Irish in the American Civil War, and we're making an eight-part series on the remarkable story of a forgotten graveyard in County Wicklow. Now, that will see one episode released every day from the 15th to the 22nd of August. Keep your eyes peeled for the promo for that series, which will be out in the next week. Then there's another major series which I've been working on for several months that's called The Road to O'Crohan. That's nearing completion too and I think that'll probably be out in late August or early September. Finally, lots of you have been asking about the War of Independence series. Meetings have taken place, plans are afoot and research is well underway for that. It's going to be about 22 episodes long and will be released weekly through the first half of next year. There's also a mini-series on the lives of women in South Tipperary on the way as well. So if you want to help get those shows over the line, you can support my work at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. The intriguing story behind today's podcast can be traced back to the year 1937 and an unusual marriage that had taken place in a normally quiet country church at Jordanstown, County Meath. The bride was the daughter of the most recent arrival in the community, the Irish-American couple, William and Margaret O'Brien, and their five children. They were a controversial family, to say the least. William Sr. was a well-known mining engineer and sometime US diplomat in South America. However, their three daughters, Margaret, Barbara, and particularly Aileen, whose life is covered in detail in the series Partisans, were outspoken and well-known far-right activists, both in Ireland and indeed Europe, in the years leading up to the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in July 1936. However, it was the wedding of Margaret, the eldest daughter, that would prove pivotal in shaping this family's experience of the Second World War. In April 1937, she had married her sweetheart from school, who she met in Freiburg, Switzerland, where she had been educated with her sisters. 
he was Count Friedrich von Wittinghoff Schell, a German aristocrat. In 1937, even though it was perilously close, the Second World War still seemed unimaginable for those gathered at this wedding. There was nothing strange about an American marrying a German. It was true that a shocking civil war had broken out in Spain, one that the bride's sister Aileen had been deeply involved in, but the guests at the wedding could take solace in the fact that that war had been contained to Spain. Hitler and Mussolini had supported the fascists and the Soviet Union had backed the anti-fascist cause, but fears at the outset of the war in 1936 that it would spread had subsided. Now the wedding itself had been an extraordinary affair the like of which the rural parish of Jordanstown had never seen before. Guests included a TD, the Chargé d'Affaires from the German Embassy in Dublin, the Chilean ambassador in Ireland and several members of the German aristocracy. Father Daly, the local priest in the community who had become a friend of the O'Brien family, had helped organise the wedding and welcomed the couple to the church on the day of the service before then graciously making way for a German priest, Theodor von Wittinghoff Schell, the brother of the groom, to perform the service. In the aftermath of the wedding, the newlyweds headed to Germany to the von Wittinghoff estates centred on Kalbeck Castle, close to the German-Dutch border. While it provided fond memories, within a few short years of this marriage, the political situation had changed dramatically and the guests at that wedding would soon find themselves on opposing sides in the Second World War. Indeed, tensions had started to rise dramatically in Europe from 1938 onwards, and eventually in 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland, Britain and France had declared war. That said, for the first year and a half at least, the war for the O'Briens in this opening phase seemed a remote and distant conflict. Their home country, the United States, was still neutral, and while their daughter, Margaret Jr., was now residing in Germany on her husband's estate on the Dutch border, she was far from any danger. The major conflicts were taking place in the East. That said, wartime restrictions slowly began to impinge on the life of the family, initially in comparatively minor ways. Margaret Sr. had travelled to Spain in 1939 to visit her daughter Aileen, who had moved there and she seems to have been unable or unwilling to risk returning to Ireland. As the war escalated, this would soon be impossible. In the summer of 1940, the Nazis expanded the war by launching their devastating blitzkrieg and conquered most of Western Europe, invading France, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, Norway and Denmark. In the aftermath of what were remarkable successes, and with an easy victory in their sight, Margaret Jr.'s husband, Friedrich, joined the German army and was posted as part of the occupation force of France. Meanwhile, for Margaret Sr., who was stuck in Spain, the war was increasingly impacting on her life. She had come to Spain in 1939, but was now stuck there. In what was a recurring theme in her letters that ended up in the military intelligence archives in Dublin, she expressed a longing to return to Ireland, although her long-term plan was to go to South America where her husband had relocated for work. In one letter she wrote, I think so often of you all, for I have a nostalgia for Ireland that is almost a physical pain. I have hoped week after week that I might be able to go back, but it has been quite impossible. But please, God, if this war will end, before I do, I shall be only a streak in the landscape in my haste to reach Dublin and I feel sure that I will eventually get there. I never permit the thought that I might not. She also commented on how her son Lawrence, called Laurencito, who had been studying in Trinity College Dublin, felt much the same. Laurencito bemoans his exile every day, and would rather be there than any place in the world. While the impact of the war during the first two years of the conflict was limited, this began to change in 1941. In June that year, Hitler launched his disastrous invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa. While Friedrich von Wittinghoff Schell, who had married into the O'Brien family, had been stationed in France up until this point, he now took a bizarre course of action, presumably sharing the virulently anti-communist views of his wife's family. He volunteered for service in Russia. This would prove a fatal move and one that would have a huge impact on the family. In the early years of the war, France had been a highly desirable place for German soldiers to be posted, given the low levels of resistance in the country at the time. The war in the East, however, was very different. 
The Germans had launched a brutal war of annihilation and were being repaid in kind. No quarter was offered or given by either side. Friedrich would learn this the hard way. In a letter that dates from late 1942, Margaret, his mother-in-law, picked up his story. He had been stationed in France after the fall of France, but when they declared war against Russia, he asked to be sent there. As she continues, it's worth bearing in mind that Friedrich was always referred to as Fritz by his friends and family. It was his first and last battle. According to his colonel, who wrote to Margaret at the time, Fritz died gloriously. If you can find any glory in dying in any war, I can't. But after his superior officer fell, also to die, Fritz had led his company and while trying to help his men to place a gun, was caught by a machine gun of the enemy and raked across the chest. He lived about twenty minutes. One of his men has sent Margaret a snapshot of the lonely grave where he lies in that awful country. Count Friedrich von wittinghoff had in fact been killed on his first day of action in Russia. This was a major blow to the family. Whilst it is difficult to have any sympathy for a man who had volunteered to fight in an invasion that resulted in the deaths of millions of people, the letters of his mother-in-law, Margaret Senior, which survive today in the military archives in Dublin, illustrate the sense of personal loss the family felt. Fritz was a fateful loss from every point of view, not only to his family, all of whom from the old baron down to his youngest sister looked to him for help and advice but also to his friends, who were innumerable, to the church, for he was an outstanding member, and to the German state, for like all Germans he was an excellent citizen. I do not have to say what his loss meant to Margaret and the two little girls who are still too young to remember him. There have been masses for him all over the world, even in China. I was so glad to know that masses had been held in Dublin for he loved Ireland very much. Indeed, it had been news of his death that the O'Briens had sent to Father Daly in Jordanstown that for some reason Irish military intelligence had seized. The letter, which remains in the files today, had been brief. Count Frederick von Fittinghoff Schell, beloved husband of Margaret O'Brien Mirbach Schell, was killed in action on July 15th, 1941, while fighting on the Russian front for God and country. As I mentioned at the start of the show, this did not reach its intended recipient and indeed judging on other letters seized by Irish military intelligence, many of the O'Brien's friends in Ireland had only discovered the news in the weeks before Christmas in 1941. However, at this point, the difficulties facing the wider O'Brien family were dramatically changing. The war was about to become complex and their loyalties tested. Among the letters in the file in Dublin is one written by a family friend who lived in Ranala, a suburb of the capital, to the family who were then based in Madrid. Taking pen to paper on December the 7th, 1941, a fateful day for reasons which we will see, they had written, My dear Billy, a couple of days ago I received, presumably from you, Fritz's in memoriam card. It was the first I knew of his death and it was a shock. In a reference to his widow, that's Margaret O'Brien Jr., now based in Germany, they said, Poor Margaret. Life will be lonely for her, and at this distance we cannot offer help or consolation in any effective form. Sympathy is all we can send, and we do that in deepest sympathy. If you were in touch with Margaret, please tell her. In what is an interesting aside, but a sign of the times, they as a matter of course then addressed the reality of wartime Ireland. The reference to fencing must relate to farm work, while the Roger mentioned must be a mutual friend, perhaps in the British Army, if they feared he was at risk. Life here, thank God, is still nearly normal, and fencing still goes on, though under some difficulties. We know Roger is safe and at home, but we have not heard from him for several months. It would be nice to hear from you sometime. It'll be long past Christmas when you get this, but I suppose our Christmas wishes are better late than never. While this letter was sent to console the O'Briens and the death of their son-in-law in Russia the previous summer, literally hours after it had been written, but before it ever arrived in Madrid for the O'Briens to read, their lives had changed dramatically. It was on that very day, December the 7th, 1941, at 6pm Irish time or 8am local time, that the Japanese had bombed the United States naval base at Pearl Harbour in Hawaii. This had huge consequences. 
Firstly, it meant that the United States was immediately at war with Japan. However, four days later, Hitler followed his Japanese allies and declared war on the USA. For the O'Briens, this created immense problems. Their daughter, Margaret, was living in the Third Reich at the time, which was now at war with her own country, the USA. Worse still, after the death of her husband Frederick in Russia, her brother William Jr., the youngest son of her parents, had travelled to Germany to be with his sister as she mourned her husband. He had been due to leave Germany before Pearl Harbour. However, a clerical error in the US Embassy had delayed matters, as Margaret explained in an intercepted letter to Dublin. Billy has been with Margaret ever, ever since Fritz was killed, and owing to a delay in the American Embassy to put his passport in order, he was caught there after the declaration of war between Germany and the USA. He had his seat on the plane and his documents except his passport. It was most unfortunate, as he was unable then to leave the country. In another letter, she worried, I don't know when he will be able to leave, as he is looked on as a prisoner of war, but on Margaret's accounts he is at liberty. She also added further details. He is allowed to live at her home where he has more than enough to eat, which solves the most vital question of this queer world in which we live. However, the passages in the letters that deal with the changing situation after Pearl Harbour are also revealing to Margaret Senior's attitudes to the Second World War, and they're not what we might expect from a US citizen whose country had just been attacked. While she fretted over the fate of her son and daughter in Germany, she referred to the war in an oddly neutral manner. It's worth stating, for the record, there was no ambiguity as to the way the USA had entered the war. Germany's ally had launched a surprise attack on the USA at Pearl Harbour and then Germany had declared war a few days later. However, Margaret O'Brien, as we heard earlier, had used the phrase the declaration of war between Germany and the USA. A strangely emotionless tone, given the circumstances and she was a US citizen. Other aspects of the letters indicate she had torn loyalties, which in some respects make sense given she and her family shared some of the far-right politics dominant in Nazi Germany. Indeed, this was very apparent in May 1942. This letter was written after safe passage had eventually been secured for her son William, who was able to leave Germany. However, on arriving in Spain, he and her other son, Lawrence, often referred to as Laurencito, wanted to sign up for the US Army. Their mother's reaction was not to fret over the danger her sons faced, but to bemoan the fact that they would die, potentially aiding the communist Soviet Union. Lauren Cheeto wants very much to go into the army. What an ironical fate for my family to possibly fight for the Russians and die among them. It's odd that she would look at the war in such terms, particularly at a time when German U-boats were attacking US shipping in the Atlantic Ocean. That said, anti-communism had always formed the core of her politics and this seems to have outweighed any patriotism to the USA. Indeed, when discussing the death of her son-in-law in the Soviet Union, she had stated, The only ray of consolation that one can extract from the terrible fact is that he died fighting against Russia. Meanwhile, the letters also revealed the fate of her widowed daughter living in Germany. Although her father-in-law was still alive, he was rarely around to help and the other members of the family were at war, so she took over the running of her husband's estate at Nyssen. Margaret does not write as often as formerly, but she and the children are well. She is very busy as all the shell boys are in the war. She has to run Nyssen alone with only occasional visits from Baron Shell. Fortunately, she is clever, and I am told that nothing daunts her. She has even taught her men how to drive and use their new tractors in the wheat fields. The last letter I had from her was from the Dutch frontier, where she had gone to buy, if she could find them, horses to start a stud farm for racehorses at Nysen. It is a new enterprise and one she will enjoy, as she is devoted to those animals and she very likely fancies herself as a trainer. These accounts indicate that the widowed Margaret Jr. was living a strangely detached life from the war, even though she was in Germany. Kalbeck Castle 
was on the Dutch frontier and in the summer of 1942 the closest battlefields were still thousands of kilometres away and overall things still looked favourable for Hitler at the time. The German army was bearing down on Leningrad and Moscow at the time while they reached the city of Stalingrad in August 1942. Indeed, in 1942 her mother's letters still implied that she thought the Germans would win the war when she addressed the fact that Friedrich's body had been buried in a lonely grave in Russia and said, Some day, when things are possible, she will bring him back to his own home. In Russia, however, the war was very different and it had reached its most intense phase. Indeed, some of the earlier letters, unbeknownst to Margaret Senior who had written them, contain anecdotal evidence that things were not going as well for the Nazis in the summer of 1942 as many had thought. While they were advancing, the casualties were mounting at an alarming rate, betrayed by the fact that another person the O'Briens knew had been killed, as Margaret's letters in the archives in Dublin relay. Did you know that Fritz's best man, young Baron von Furstenberg, was killed before Moscow, a month after Fritz? Margaret Senior had also received details of his death, one that is strangely similar to the death of her son-in-law. He had distinguished himself to the extent of having been placed on the staff, but asked for active work in the tanks division where he had been an officer. And while supervising an attack, his tank was struck by a bomb, but he was unhurt. While trying to rescue his men from the tank, a machine gun got him across the chest. And like Fritz, he only lived a short while. The letters I have had from the mother of these boys, many of them would tear your heart out. It's highly likely that one or both of the men did not die in such gallant circumstances. These letters may well be the efforts of German soldiers on the front trying to hide the realities of war from the civilian population back home. While two members from the wedding party in Jordanstown back in 1937 had died, up and down Germany hundreds and thousands of families were hearing similar news. In Russia, astute German army commanders could see their fighting strength was being sapped away in the endless space and countless battles against an enemy that wouldn't or couldn't recognise defeat when everyone else assumed they were beaten. By early 1943, this contributed to the military disaster when the Germans were beaten at the Battle of Stalingrad, which was referred to obliquely by Margaret Senior in a letter she wrote to a friend in Dublin on St Valentine's Day in 1943. Her optimism and hope for a German victory had now vanished and it was replaced by fears for the future. She hadn't heard from her daughter in several months. It has been many months since I heard from Margaret, but I trust that nothing awful has happened to her or the children. Bad news travels in spite of everything, and as I have had no news, I hope the old adage holds. I have not written her either for a very long time, for after all she is an American, and the less contact she has with the outside world, the less liable she is to difficulties. Then she turned to the outcome of the war. What the aftermath will be, God only knows. I don't know if you look forward to the coming of peace with the same anxiety I do. The development of events in the eastern part of Europe has been so surprising. The letter was written only 12 days after the German army had surrendered in Stalingrad, a crushing defeat and the turning point of the Second World War, something that was evident to Margaret herself at the time. It makes me wonder if these events will lead to uncontrollable results. Again, this is indicative of her political views and loyalty. In that same February, the US, her own country, had scored a major victory in the Pacific at Guadalcanal. However, Margaret O'Brien made no reference to this or any other US victory in her letters. Events moved rapidly in the following 24 months. In June 1944, the defeat of Germany was sealed. The build-up of US forces in Britain led to the Allied invasion of France on D-Day. Meanwhile, in the East, at the same time, the Russians inflicted what proved to be the greatest single defeat in German military history in Operation Bagration, a series of battles that inflicted half a million casualties on the German army that summer. It was now clear they had backed the losers and Margaret O'Brien Jr., who was living at Kalbeck Castle, would have to face a reckoning of one kind or another. By April 1945, the US First Army, having invaded Holland, pushed across the German border. On April the 9th, they captured the region around Kalbeck Castle, where Margaret was living. 
a journalist attached to the First Army on hearing of an American-born countess living in a local castle, went to interview her. While she told him her name was Virginia for some reason, she did not hide who she was or her family background, and newspapers in the USA quickly made the connection between her and her more famous sister Aileen, a widely known fascist sympathiser. When they asked why she had not left Germany in 1941, she responded somewhat surprisingly. Would you be coward enough to leave a sinking ship like a rat? Margaret was adamant she would remain in Germany after the war. When she died is unclear. However, her sister Aileen married Felix von Wittinghofschel, the brother of Friedrich, who had been killed in Russia, and they moved back to Germany and lived at Kalbeck Castle. What happened to their mother, whose letters Irish military intelligence had taken such an interest in, is also unclear. Their father William had died in 1944, but Margaret's letters had stopped in 1943, or at least Irish military intelligence had ceased to take an interest in them after this point. I wasn't able to find a date of death for Margaret Sr. This is complicated by the fact that she could have been in Spain, South America, Ireland, the United States or possibly even Germany. That said, her health appears to have been failing in her final letter in the file from 1943. Although aged only 63 at the time, she had written, I have found letter writing not only difficult but practically impossible. My poor mind that was never anything to boast of seems to have become dumb and inarticulate. The letters of the O'Brien family provide an interesting perspective on the Second World War, but also their presence in the archives definitely left me wondering about the potentials this must have created for personal relationships at the time. Did people who never received letters wonder had their friends stopped writing to them, not realising that the letters had in fact been intercepted by military intelligence? That's the end of today's show, folks. Again, I'd like to thank Aidan Crow and Megan Carter for their narrations. If you want to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. I'll be back on August the 15th for that podcast series with Damien Shields. Until then, Sloan. Sloan.